I, I really don't believe politics and the pulpit uh, are synonymous. I, I, I know that many people do. Many people are uh, flagrant in their use of the pulpit as a chance to um, enunciate their political beliefs and, and so forth. What I want to tell you is when there's a crossover, when the subject is in both areas, it's political and it's spiritual, then the, the church should not be trying to influence politics. We've got a message to preach. I said, we've got a message to preach. The message we preach is not a politically conservative message. It is not a politically liberal message. It is just the message. It's the word, and that's where we need to stand as far as what we preach. Now, how the people respond to that message is a matter of individual uh, response. And so there are many hot topics. If I were just to name the topics, it would cause division politically. Things that are certainly spiritual matters, but they have been taken into the realm of politics. And I want to just say this in defense of these messages that we're sharing this month. These messages are politically incorrect. And, I, and I'm not really apologizing for that because we're not trying to fit under the scrutiny of your politics. I, I just want to talk to you about what the Bible says on these subjects. And I'm going to try with God's help, without fear or compromise, just to say what the Bible says. And um, that was the case when I met I, what I shared last week, and that's certainly the, the case of what I share this week. And I just want to say this as I get ready to launch into this message today. There, some uh, politician of the last century came up with this phrase. He said that the Constitution of the United States guaranteed the separation of church and state. I would guarantee you that anyone that makes that statement is not concerned about the wording of the Constitution because those words are never found in the Constitution of the United States. And there's no evidence that our founding fathers had intentions of keeping the influence of a people's faith out of the governing body. In fact, the freedom of religion does not guarantee that we will not pray in schools. It does not guarantee we will not pray in public places. It does not guarantee that we will not post the Ten Commandments because as it's been brought to my attention, the Ten Commandments have been placed all over the public buildings all over Washington, D.C. by our founding fathers. What it guarantees is that the church, that rather the government will not form a religion and compel people to follow their church. Such as the Church of England that they were leaving when they came and founded this country. And so if I say things that sound like that I'm putting mandates before our Congress and putting mandates before our State Department and the executive office, the executive branch of government, I am not putting anything before them. I'm simply saying what the word of God has said. I'm speaking to you a spiritual truth today with God's help. And if we consider ourselves a Christian nation, then our government should line up with that. And if we are considering the men that we are voting for, whatever party they're from, if we're considering we're voting for good Christian men, then they should line up to what the Bible says. And so I want to share with you uh, t uh, today, beginning um, from the book of Genesis. Turn to the, the uh, first book of the Bible.
in the book of Genesis chapter number 32. Now, I'm going to tell you again, I, I've shared this with you. When we talk about these early days of the nation of Israel, the early days of uh, God's dealing with Abraham and Jacob especially, there are things that I really do not have the expertise to, uh, to explain away. So when I'm telling you in just a few moments here that the center of our attention for this scripture reading who is Jacob has two wives I really am not prepared to give further explanation about that today but um, here's what the Bible says in the book of Genesis beginning with chapter 32 and verse 22 he arose that night and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the fort of Jacob. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Heavenly Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would give us understanding to what the word of God says and how we should respond to it. In Jesus' precious name. Now, Lord God, I pray that the full counsel of God would be before us today and that we'd respond to your voice and obey your directive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We, we um, as a nation today in, in, in America, um, I have a hard time keeping up with who our friends are and who our enemies are. Now, Years ago, things were a lot simpler. Uh, we all talk about the day when the Iron Curtain was brought down. We talk about when the communist bloc of nations, the Soviet Union, uh, disintegrated. And, and Well, I would just tell you this. I'm not saying those were necessarily a better situation, but it was easier to understand. I knew who was on whose side then, and, and now I seldom do. When I was uh, in grade school, I first heard the names of the nation, Iraq and Iran. I, 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 at that time, did not even know there was such a country as until I got the fifth grade in a geography class, and we're studying the Middle East, and I heard, and I heard don't, don't let that alarm you, there's, there's names of other countries we looked at for the first time then, whose name I still have a hard time keeping track of. And, uh, but Iraq and Iran and be became known to me for the first time in the modern sense. Um, the maps have changed over the last century. And uh, these countries that were one time a conglomerate, the, the, uh, the land of Persia has uh, been disintegrated, di divided and, and, and renamed. And um, so in the 60s, Iran was our friend. But in the 80s, Iraq was our friend. And now nobody in that land is our friend. Um, and so um, depending upon how the State Department of the United States has uh, approached the balance, which is, is in, 
is in fact the way international politics goes, a balance of power, a balance of relationship. We have uh, favored one country and other countries have favored us. But in 1948, a new country was given charter in the Middle East. And at the same time, it was an ancient country. In 1948, by an act of the British Parliament, the land of Palestine was designated, it was under control, it had, been a, it had been after World War II under the control of Great Britain. And it was designated as a homeland for the Jews. They set up their own government, set up their own defense system, and a nation there evolved. And from its earliest days, we have had a, um, a diplomatic relationship with Israel in early, earliest days that was very health, healthy, and we have been supportive of that fledgling government since its founding in 1948. And the reasons for that we're going to discuss in this message today. We have reasons to have an alliance with Israel. These people of Israel, this government, need to become our very closest ally. What they are waiting to hear in the Middle East <coughs> excuse me, is clarification. What Israel is asking the United States to say is to all of their surrounding detractors is they would like the United States to say that an attack on Israel is equivalent to an, an attack on the United States of America. That we would defend Amer uh, Israel the same way we would defend our own property. The problem with that is now that we found out that even an attack on our embassy is not necessarily an attack on the United States. Some people have felt um, compelled to apologize to the people that attacked us. But I want to talk to you today about the importance of Israel and the importance of our being an ally with Israel and why it is that we uh, feel a closeness and an allegiance to the small nation of, of Israel. And uh, that's kind of interesting. We, we read this story today, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. The man that is, that is known as Jacob here is the grandson of Abraham. It was Abraham that God called. Abraham was called the father of faith. It was Abraham that God called when he lived with his own father, earthly father, <clears throat> in Ur of the Chaldees. Put a call in his life and said, I want you to go to Canaan. So he left Ur of the Chaldees and made his journey. Stopped in a city called Haran, yet in the land of the Assyrian. And they, he stayed there until his father Terah passed away, died in Haran. When Terah had died in Haran. Abraham heard the voice of the Lord speak to him and said, Now, lift up your eyes, and I want you to leave the land of your nativity and go into a land that I will show you. And as he made his way to Haran, to, uh, out of Haran and came to Canaan, God took him up on the mount that overlooked into the valley of the Jordan River, and he said, Now look, north, south, east, and west. Everything that your eye sees from this mountain, and from that mountain he can see from the east side of the Jordan River all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. He said, everything that you see, I'm going to give you and to your seed forever. This is your land. I'm not going to go into the many details of the prophecy that came to Abraham in the next several years. But in essence, God said, everywhere your foot treads from this point on, I'm giving it to you and to your descendants as a possession. He also told him that there would become a time that his descendants would go into another land, become a mighty nation there, and that he would bring them back to the land of promise. And that was um, Abraham's promise, his, his covenant, his legacy, and uh, pass that on to his son Isaac. 
Isaac had two sons. God chose Jacob of the two sons and that the birthright would be passed on to Jacob. And so now we've read the story of Jacob. Jacob had this name. You remember there was an issue in this story that I read to you from the text about the name of Jacob. Jacob meant a hill grabber. That was because at the birth he was a twin. His brother was born first, but when his brother was born, came out with Jacob's hand on his heel. So they gave him the name hill grabber, Jacob. That was his name. He, and all of his life he carried that, um, that reproach that he had been a hill grabber at his birth and a deceiver. He, he used deception to steal his brother's birthright. And um, if you follow the story, you know that Jacob, at the, at, at, the, at the point that the revelation came to his brother Esau, that Jacob had stolen the birthright, Jacob fled for his life and went to land that his mother had come from. And um, that's where he married these two wives, sisters. And they each had handmaidens. So he had two wives and two concubines and had children by all of them. Had a total of, at this point, 11. Later would have one more son, 12 sons. He became the father of 12 tribes. Each one of these sons represented a tribe. One of the 12 tribes, one of the 12 sons, God declared was his priestly tribe. So he did not get an inheritance from Jacob, but an inheritance from God, the Levites. And in order that it would still be 12 tribes, the double portion, instead of going to the oldest son, went to the son whose name was Joseph. Joseph's two sons each had a full inheritance. So again, we have 12 tribes plus a priestly tribe. These were descendants of the man who had been named by his parents, Jacob. But we're talking today about the day that Jacob wrestled with the Lord. Certainly the Lord could overpower any man. But... Jacob persistently hang on to the Lord. Wasn't able to defeat him, wasn't able to master him, but with all his strength through the night, facing a uh, certain death the next day, he hung on to the Lord and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, I've always heard, did y'all ever hear someone say that the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman? That God will never make you do anything you don't want to do. That God's always very gentle. And he knocked Jacob's hip out of joint. A lot of people, something happened to them and they fell in the service and they bumped their head. Well, that must not have been God. Well, what do you think they said about Jacob? <laughs> Jacob wrestled and makes him a cripple for the rest of his life. It's quiet in here. All y'all been saying that about the Holy Spirit being a gentleman, I can tell. Well, the, the Lord just knocked Jacob's hip out of joint and made him a cripple for the rest of life. That must not have been God. Look how he's limping. It was God. I said it was God. And God said, you've always been called Jacob, but from this day on, your name is Prince with God. Israel means Prince with God. That's your name from now on. Someone wants to call you hill grabber, you say, no. My name is Prince with God because you have wrestled with God and you've wrestled with men and you have prevailed. And he says, blessing, I'm going to bless you. I command my blessings on you. This is the word of God and God's word. He will not repent when he says, I command my blessings on you. Yeah. Listen to what God has said concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am going to bless you so thoroughly that if you go out into the field, you're going to find that you are blessed out there in the field. And if you stay in the city, I'm going to bless you in the city. And you can try to run and find my blessings if you want to, but you don't have to because 
Wherever you go, my blessings are going to overtake you. And he said, furthermore, not only am I going to bless you and I'm going to bless your seed and I'm going to bless your crops and I'm going to bless your field and I'm going to bless your livestock. I'm going to make you successful. But if people will bless you, I will bless them. If people curse you, I will curse them. This is Israel. This is the father of the nation. This is the beginning of the, the, the uh, culture that's there in Palestine today. And this is why we as a people would do well following God's directive to put blessing on Israel. And if we do, God promises to put blessing on us. But for us to curse Israel means that God would put a curse upon us. We, we have an allegiance or we have an a, a alliance with Israel, a natural one, because first of all, we serve the same God. This is the God of creation. Other, other religions, we, talk, we, we got, someone's confused. Someone thought that the United States had been founded to become the cage for every unclean bird in the world. Someone thought that our forefathers came to this nation in order to make this place a melting pot of every doctrine of devils that any false religion ever came up with. I want you to know that is not why this country was founded. This country was not founded to be a freedom for false religion. This has been founded to be a place of freedom to worship the Lord God. And we have not been established to be a den of devils and a doctrine of demons and a religion of Satan. This is a place that was established where people could come and with clear conscience call upon the creator of the universe and bow down in allegiance and worship to him. We have an alliance with the Jews, first of all, because we are serving the God of creation. We are serving the God, we are serving the God who has established the moral standard. You know, we hear this terminology all the time, the Judeo-Christian ethic, and all of us seem to ascribe to that, that, uh, uh, to that concept. What you should understand is the Judeo-Christian ethic was first the Judeo ethic. That's where it came from. There was a Judeo ethic before there even was a Christian. And so we ascribe to what they led us in by example. And the other allegiance that we have together with them has to do with our promise. Now, we could not in a few moments here today talk about everything to do with the promise. But let me just summarize. The Jews today are in enmity. A Jewish believer today is in an enmity with God. God loves Israel. He loves the descendants of Jacob. And he has protected them. And the, command, the commandment of blessing that he put upon them back in the days of Abraham have continued with them even until now. But there is a problem. The problem is that they missed it when the Son of God came and lived among them. They missed it, and it has caused an enmity between the Jews and God. But I want to tell you something. The promise is that one day that enmity is going to be removed. And one day the scales are going to fall off their eyes the way it fell off the eyes of Saul of Tarsus. And they're going to realize the mistake that they made. I mean as a nation. The Bible says the country is going to cry out with one voice and say to God, Oh, that you would rent the heavens and come down. That the mountains will flow at your presence. And when he does, they're going to wail at him because he's the one that they pierced. And they're going to say to him, What are those wounds that you received? in your hands, and in your feet. He's going to say, these are the wounds that I received in the house of my friend 
They're going to wail upon, well because of him and they will repent. And they will accept that that day the Messiah that they rejected 2,000 years ago, they will accept him and recognize him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they have the promise that they will be given at that time the fulfillment of the promise to their forefather Jacob and their forefather Abraham that they will receive their inheritance and they will dwell in the land and they will be blessed. They will be safe on every side. That their fields are going to burst forward and, and the desert is going to blossom like a rose. In those days of peace is when you've heard folks talk about when the lion is going to lay down like a lamb, like the wild beast of the field are going to be led by a child. In those days, God will bless them. And that promise that God has made to Israel is the promise that he's made to you and me. We have that in common with them. That's why we, of all other religions of the world, this is the one world that we look at and say, these people are our brethren. They serve the same God and they have the same promises and the same destiny that we have. We recognize them in that way. We owe them a great debt. They brought us the oracles of God. The Old Testament scriptures are because despite the backslidings and the idolatry that was ramp, uh, rampant among the nation of Israel, there have always been faithful in every generation that have preserved for us the oracles of God. We owe them a great debt because it's because of them that we have a Savior. We were talking about in the Sunday school class today how God spoke to Abraham and said, by your seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. He did not say of seeds as of many, but seed, he was talking about one, and that one was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he came from the nation of the Jews and came from the descendants of Abraham, and he's been a blessing. And every one of us today that are saved are saved because of the gift that was given to us from the nation of Israel. The Messiah came from that country. And then furthermore, we have the, con the uh, congruent view of the prophetical scriptures of the future that we share with them. We share a destiny. Now, the Bible says that God spoke to Abraham and said, I'm going to make your seed like the sand of the seashore for multitude. If you could number, if you could take in your hand and number the grains of sand on the seashore, then you would be able to number all of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That sounds astronomical. It must be a hyperbole. And I, I want you to know it's not. It's not a hyperbole. It's an absolute promise. It's going to be just like that because God's not limited to time or space. And, and it will come to pass just like that. You know, you could reach down and take one handful of sand and never be able to count all the grains that's in one handful. Yet God said... All the sand on all the seashore, I'm going to make your seed like all of those. Now, here's something that's a little bit more mind-boggling. And, and I'm getting this from uh, scientists that are, uh, as far as I understand, no particular spiritual significance. God said not only to Abraham, I'm going to make your seed like the sand. He said, I'm going to make your seed like the stars of heaven. If you could count the stars in heaven, then you could count how many descendants you're going to have in your spiritual seed. I'll tell you what, I've looked into the sky and tried to figure out how many, how many stars do you think are there? You know, stars are deceptive. In a, in a night when there's a lot of moonlight, you don't see nearly so many stars. But a couple of years ago, when Dallas and I had gone to Wyoming up in the high mountains, and the air was so clear. In a moonless night, I saw more stars than I'd ever in my life imagined that there possibly could be. Could you number those stars? And what I'm finding out is that every time a greater capacity lens is, de is developed by uh, astronomers, that they find complete new worlds, whole new sections of stars. It's as if there is an endless number of stars going out to an infinity of space. And God says, God says, I'm going to make your spiritual seed like the stars of heaven. 
And um, scientists are telling us today that seemingly there may be as many stars in heaven as there are grains of sand in the seashore. It absolutely blows the mind to think about it, how big of a universe this is. But God says this, said I, to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. The nation of Israel, that's, that's your descendant. That's the sea, the sand of the seashore. And Jesus Christ being the firstborn among many brethren of a whole other nation. He said, these are your spiritual seed. We're the seed of Abraham by faith. I said, we are the seed of Abraham by faith. And as surely as God compared his earthly seed to the grains of sand, he compares the number of the spiritual seed to the stars of heaven, countless, impossible to number. And that is the household of faith. And that is where we stand today. And that's why we embrace this nation spiritually as our brethren. I've got this downer. You know, we, we've been called to pray for, for, the, for, the, Israel, for the nation of Israel. The Bible teaches us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It teaches us to pray for the people, the children of God. We, we do that. We, but, the, but the sad thing that I have to tell you is that they're no different than any other people on the earth. Without Jesus, there is no provision for redemption. These people are our brothers because they know the same God. But they, without Jesus, have no means to get through to that God. We pray for them, not only for peace in Jerusalem, not only for the security of their country, but we pray for them that their eyes would be open. You know, we hear now and again about thousands even that accept Jesus as Savior and they call themselves completed Jews. Because what I'm telling you today is as much as we love this country and we appreciate the gift that they've given us today, that without Jesus, they're still lost. And we pray for their redemption. We... Um, we have a great God, and uh, the plan of salvation is great and immense. And we pray because the same, here, is the, here is the great promise. God has promised to, to not only bless the people that bless Israel, but he says he will prosper the people who prays for Jerusalem. I, th this could have been thrown into last month's sermon, right? If you will pray for Jerusalem, if you'll carry a burden for that city, for the safety of that city, God says, I will make your way prosperous. I will prosper you. So we pray for them. And we pray for them because the fact is that those who are, from a, that are in religiously in Judaism, believing in the laws and the ordinances and the traditions and the rituals for their, for their salvation, they're lost without Jesus they're lost. And so we, we, we pray for them in that regard. But I want to tell you something. We pray for Christian people, so-called Christian people as well. You know, the, the greatest force, I suppose, that the devil uses today to keep people away from God is religion. Now, before you look at me confused, think about what I'm getting ready to tell you right now. How many times have you invited somebody to go to a special service with you, and they said, well, I'm, I'm Presbyterian. I'm Episcopal. I only said that because usually what they say is I'm Baptist because everybody's a Baptist. No, I, I, won't, I don't go to church with you because I'm a Baptist. Um, what, I, what I'm trying to say is people that need God can't find God because there are some religions. They don't, because see, our connection with God is not our denomination, but it's a relationship. It's a personal thing. We're either in with God or we're not in with God. And it has nothing to do with what title we wear 
Doesn't matter if we're a member of a church or not a member of a church. Those things are not significant. What's important is do we know Jesus Christ as our Savior? And so you could be a Jew and, and, and be lost. You could be an Assemblies of God church member and you could be lost. Because it's not a matter of having a card with a signature on it. It's a matter of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's what it's about. I'd like for you to stand with me today, please.